can't wait to hear more about your work. Uh, Shak, how did you uh, came across Uyghur? It's a good question. I think originally through through a translator and poet friend, Jeffrey Yang, who had befriended Ahmad John Osman, this uh, poet who's now in exile in Canada. Okay, I'm I'm just gonna sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt because that was a casual conversation. I just want to welcome everybody. We're now we're now live. So hold that thought, Shuk. Uh okay. and carry on, carry on your answer to that question. Uh welcome everybody to uh the second uh panel of uh, this three-day celebration of International Mother Language Day. Uh our our, our conference, uh, Commerce Conference is called uh, Manchester in Translation. Um this panel, uh, my name is Rob Page. Um, I'm I'm uh, the founder of Comma Press. This panel is looking specifically at keeping underrepresented literatures alive through translation, uh, and we'll use lots of different different phrases uh, and words uh, to describe what we mean by under underrepresented languages. You might hear endangered languages, or um, um, I, I may uh, use air quotes uh, around the word small languages, but obviously every language is infinite and its literatures are individually infinite um but yeah we're with thank you for joining us we're, we're joined by three fantastic uh phenomenal activists uh in this field and translators uh, i'm just going to introduce them uh briefly uh shook uh is a poet translator and editor winner of the 2021 words without borders uh poems in translation contest uh uh, Sh uh, Shuk currently directs uh, Kashkal Books, a publishing project based in, in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. As a translator, they have worked extensively with Isthmus, uh, Zapotec and uh, Zoke uh, languages in Mexico, as well as a number of African languages, most recently uh, Bubi, a Bantu language of Equatorian Guinea, uh, Pitch English, a uh, Creole language spoken in the island of Bioko, off Africa. Equatorial Guinea. Uh, Shook is also the founder of Phony Media, a publishing house set up to support translations of uh, Uyghur and Lingala, which is a language of Congo. Uh, Johanna Dom Domokosh uh, is a poet, translator and editor and professor at the Giaspar Karoli University in Budapest. Uh, she's the author of four monographs specializing in Sami uh, literature and is the editor of more than 20 books. Uh, she has been an international promoter of Sami uh, um, literature uh, for more than two decades. Same, of course, is the Uralic language spoken in uh, by the Same people in the northernmost parts of Scandinavia, but we'll hear a lot more about that. Uh, her most recent book is Endangered Literature, uh, Essays on uh, Literary Interculturalism, Translingualism and Vulnerability. Uh, she's currently uh, leading the, the Gruppe B Translation and Book uh, Production Lab at the University of Bielefeld. Um, finally, we have uh, Sandra Tomel, uh, who was born in uh, Pemba, Mozambique. In 2007, she made history, becoming the first Mozambican to translate and publish literature with her uh, debut translation of Nicola Amaniti's novel, uh, I'm Not Scared, into Portuguese. Uh, from 2010, she uh, set up the, uh, the, the annual literary translation competition uh, in Mozambique. Um, and in 2018, she founded Editora Trinta Zero Nove, 3009, uh, uh, to, to publish Mozambique and indigenous, indigenous languages, including Makua, Sena, Chang, uh, Changana, uh, Tswa, and Bitonga. So that's my very, very brief introduction to, to all of you and your, your complicated and fascinating work. Um, but I thought I'd just ask you to, to introduce yourselves a little bit and how you came uh, to, uh, to, to work in these languages. Shuk, you were uh, talking about Uyghur, but tell us, tell us more about about all of your work, how you how you came to specialize in these particular languages. Sure, thank you, Ra, and, and thank you so much to you and to Niad Kama for putting this wonderful event together. It's really an honor to be on this panel with with the two of you as well. I'm really excited to learn learn more about your work. In my own my own case, I think my, my foray into into this field really came first through my engagement with indigenous Mexican languages. And I was born in the United States, but grew up in mostly in Mexico City, where I was exposed to a kind of a, what I'd call an undercurrent of, of these languages, which you'd sometimes hear at, at the market when you went to buy vegetables, so, but, but would always be kind of 
sidelined or just beneath the surface, it felt like, which as a kid, even as a kid, made me profoundly curious. And later, as an undergrad, rather than studying literature, I, I went into linguistics, even though what I was ultimately interested in was literature. I wanted to approach it from a descriptivist perspective. I really wanted to understand it more scientifically, I feel. And from there, I think, you know, I, I got going studying Nahuatl, a contemporary language that still has about 1.5 million speakers, the language of the Aztecs. It's about as removed from classical Nahuatl today as our English from, from Shakespeare's. And then from there, I was introduced to Isthmus Zapotec poetry from a bit further south in Mexico and just developed really rich, rich relationships with a number of Isthmus Zapotec poets. And my background in, in linguistics gave me some entry point to Isthmus Zapotec, even though at the time and, and today still, I would, I would not claim to be a, a full-fledged speaker of the language. And this is back, you know, early in my career. And by about 2013, a few years after I had, had become pretty active as a literary translator, I wound up founding a publishing house because of all of the writers I was meeting through my networks as a, as a translator, but also as a writer myself who couldn't find publishers in English if, if they could find translators. And in 2013, we started publishing publishing literature, primarily poetry, because that's what I care most about, but some fiction, some graphic novels, things like that as well. And really found from, from early on, you know, both through this network of, of writers and translators, but as, as we were developing a reputation for publishing literature translated from languages that, that we don't commonly see. And I think here in the U.S. we became kind of the, the go-to publisher if somebody had something that, that would be too, you know, deemed too weird or insufficiently commercial for for most others and because here in the US you you can be a nonprofit as a publisher that enabled us to to take risks and spend money in ways that a, a conventional commercial publisher wouldn't so i think that's that's kind of a very abbreviated version of my my foray into this field and uh, i'll be happy to talk more about it but i can't wait to hear from sandra and and johanna Sandra, how did you how did you find yourself uh, doing what you're doing now, and why why was it important for you to to uh, focus on these languages and, and set up this press in the way you have done? Okay, uh, long uh, story short, I have a degree in architecture, but I was born in a very particular family. Uh, my father is from the southern part of. Uh, Mozambique and my mother from the northern region so they don't speak the same mother tongue and because of the moment the, the Mozambique was living politically and socially we were raised as uh, Portuguese uh, with Portuguese as our mother tongue and I believe that this being uh, bilingual but in a, in a way not uh, being able to to speak either my mom or my dad's uh, mother tongue gave me this uh, this um hunger to to bring those uh, languages alive because you have to bear in mind that Mozambique is a 30 million people um, country we have uh, 42 spoken languages and one sign language and if you look at uh, the percentage of speakers of each language you don't find more than 26 percent that's for Makua and that being said I uh, started working as a translator in the middle of my career as a, an architect and uh, I saw that uh, translators are not really considered uh, or important in our society, despite our strong uh, oral tradition, our uh, linguistic variety. So I started the, the, the literary transla translation competition in uh, 2010. And then it evolved because I was knocking on doors, uh, trying to pitch these translation projects that we had so many exciting authors that were unknown in, uh, in Mozambique but no publisher was willing to invest in translation. Uh, it's uh, considered um, 
somehow a lower quality of literature if it is translated. So it was, I think, obvious that the next step should be to set up a translation uh, publisher. So we only do translation. That's why we are called uh, 3009, inspired by September 30th, uh, International Translation Day. And that's how it started. Uh, we um, first uh, invited all these amateur translators to uh, translate into Portuguese. But then I realized, OK, they speak a different mother tongue, unlike myself. So why not? trying to bring all these texts from French, from uh, German, from uh, uh, European languages into Mozambican languages. And this was very, very interesting indeed, because uh, people were happy to try and translate these concepts, because uh, sometimes we have untranslatable terms. And uh, in Bantu languages, uh, there are often many. And I believe that soon we will be um, also translating literature because uh, we run a uh, um, creative uh, writing workshop with women for um, Mozambican Women's Day that's coming on uh, April 7. So hopefully we'll have uh, these young female writers writing in their mother tongue and then we'll translate into uh, Portuguese or uh, English as a lingua franca. But I think that uh, the most important thing uh, that we are doing is uh, planting the seed that our languages, our Mozambican languages, our Bantu language, they are not dialects, they are not minor. Uh, even if we have uh, as little speakers from my, for instance, my mother's mother tongue is Kimwan. It's only spoken by 3% of Mozambican. So it's a language that's slowly vanishing. So I believe that by doing this effort we are contributing in a way to standardizing the way the the the, the language is written because it's mostly oral and i think that by doing that we are contributing to making a record and say there was this language it's it's important and we should pass it on to our next generations thank you sandra uh johanna um tell us a little bit how you uh, about how you got into uh, studying and being an activist for the Sami language I and mean, why it's so important to you. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me as well. And uh, I'm very happy to meet Sandra and Shok uh, here and get uh, further inspirations from them. When I uh, studied in, started my um, uh, linguistic studies in Helsinki, beginning of 1990s, the second day arriving to Helsinki, I visited Suomen and Kiriakauppa. That was the biggest bookstore in uh, Scandinavia at that time. An, a huge building full with uh, uh, books on, on many levels. Right at the big, uh, at the, behind the, the entrance door, there was a beautiful book by Nilsa Slakvarkiape. By now it's translated as Son, My Father. And it contained 300 documentary photos on Sami people and 300 Yoi poems written by Nils Aslak Valkiape. And as a young poet, I decided I want to translate this book. So I took mm -hmm. this book and I was very lucky. At that time, there were just very, very few places where one could learn Sami. One of them was Helsinki University. And I uh, got into a course. I started to learn and parallel also to translate uh, Sami literature. This was a very lucky uh, time because um, we can say that uh, with the 1990s, the second wave of the Sami culture emancipation started and really started to bring very, very good results from the first wave started around 1970s. And uh, uh, we know that among the indigenous people, the Sami and the Inuit people are the most successful. So many other indigenous people uh, get inspired by the way they um, fight for their linguistic revitalization, for their lit literary, artistic, and all kind of uh, uh, other um, representations. And um, uh, by uh, studying the language uh, in Helsinki, um, I got the, uh, um, the opportunity to, to um, act also as a teacher of Sami language around the world, wherever I uh, got my um, um, uh, university affiliations from uh, Berlin to Budapest, to UCLA, to Berkeley, 
to Bielefeld, um, and uh, I always uh, uh, teach the language, but also uh, we do a lot of uh, poetry translation. Since 2013, I am uh, very active uh, with my uh, Group AB translation lab and book, book production lab. And um, we translate uh, Sami authors into um, Hungarian, English, uh, and definitely German. Recently, we published a wonderful uh, comprehensive anthology of Sami literature containing originals from the 10 Sami languages and their uh, German uh, translation. Thank you. You were going to, uh, you, had a, you had a visual just to show us a little bit about uh, the, the Sami languages. Uh, do you yes. want to share that now? This is a map showing the three uh, larger uh, linguistic groups, the South, the Central, and the Eastern Sami languages. Uh, you can see that the, this area marked in red, here live uh, most of the Sami, 20,000, which is again, not very many. Um, other languages, uh, Sami languages are spoken by just a few people or a few ten or few hundreds of people. So I speak uh, North Sami and uh, the literary movement in uh, the Northern part is the most productive. It is also uh, important to underline that the Sami community is very willing to revitalize their language. And uh, being a linguist uh, um, dealing with Finno Ugric and Turkic languages, we can see that uh, there are certain uh, et ethnic groups where uh, the, the linguistic backbone is broken and it's very difficult to start a revitalization process. The simulation is just, just so, so much uh, in progress. But the Sami people are very willing, very conscious of their very special heritage. I also, I'm happy to remind um, or tell you that the most, uh, uh, the oldest singing tradition practiced in Europe is that of the Sam. It is called Yoiking. And if you have a chance, just enter Yoiking in YouTube and you will get the opportunity to listen to archaic, uh, uh, archival material as well as world music, including Yoik. Thank, thank you. Um, the, the, the work of translating into the, um, the indigenous languages uh, is obviously that how that helps uh, those indigenous, indigenous languages in the way that Sandra uh, gave an example uh, is, is, is obvious. I mean, it's, it's, it's fantastic uh, to, have those, uh, to have this literature available in, in, in books in these languages. But going the other way, translating uh, from, from these languages into uh, global lingua francas like English or European languages, how does that help the original uh, language survive? Uh, because to play devil's advocate for a moment, you could say that that's just a, a westernization of it, uh, a kind of procurement of the original literature into the European languages, uh, and 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 therefore it does, you know, it's it's preserved so we can move on. How how does translating um, into into English or into Portuguese or into a European language, uh, a lingua uh, lingua franca, help the original minoritarian language? Sure, I, I'm happy to to tell one anecdote that I think is a, a good example, specifically in the case of, of indigenous Mexican literatures, which have traditionally been marginalized in, in favor of Spanish language literature in Mexico, and traditionally felt held at bay by the gatekeepers of Spanish language literature. It's very much a one-way street you know these writers working in isma zapotec or soque or nawa they're reading their spanish language contemporaries considering themselves part of a much bigger dialogue but they're not being read in spanish because of all sorts of long-held and often unconscious prejudices i remember when the poetry translation center in london published a chat book of my translations of, of victor teran back in 2010, I we toured the UK, did a great event in Manchester, in, in fact, and 
when Victor got back to Huchitan, he speaks Isthmus Zapotec, which has a, a, a very established literary tradition both oral tradition, of course, but also also written tradition going back several centuries. And the first thing he did when he got home was essentially bootleg his own book uh, because it was there was so much demand for it there. There's 100,000 speakers of Isthmus Zapotec compared to many of, of Mexico's languages. It's it's still rather robust in terms of its its use in everyday life, but also its its production. Um, of literature and use on radio, things like that. Of course, it is still still quite fragile. We know how quickly how quickly that that speaker population could potentially decline. But for Victor's readers, for his friends and contemporaries, for young people, the facing pages in this bilingual Isthmus Zapotec English book were a really powerful tonic, I think, to the common idea that, you know, just like like um, Sandra was mentioning at one point, Mexico's many indigenous languages, by some counts, well over 150, they're always dismissed as dialects. They're considered not just subliterary, but but almost as as sublanguages, and the act of being translated into English, which I think you can certainly argue is a language that has has dominated Spanish in many contexts, at least here in the US, but it enabled these indigenous writers to circumvent some of the traditional gatekeeping. And it was a source, a huge source of pride to be translated into English. And, and in some sense, almost a, a clap back at the idea that that their literature didn't deserve translation into Spanish or didn't deserve a wider audience. And Victor, I think, printed a thousand copies of his own bootleg book and immediately within a day they were gone. Uh, I wanted to get one when I went to visit him and I couldn't find one. Nobody would give it up. <laughs> uh, so that's just just one example. And and for Victor, I think he's He's also translated a lot of world literature into Isthmus Zapotec because he thinks that that translation is essential to the health of the language and its literature, which I think is a kind of converse idea that's that's pretty inspiring to me and sounds a lot like some of the work you're doing, Sandra, which I'd love to hear more about. Thank it's, you, Shuk. Uh, and uh, we have also been a colony, uh, and I think that um, the process of assimilation, that's something that was present here, in a way hindered the use of our um, local languages. And, and I'm the example of that. Uh, when Mozambique became independent in 1975, um, it was difficult to select one of the 42 languages to be a national language. Thus, they opted for uh, Portuguese as the official language. Uh, and that gave birth to this generation that um, has severed every link to the, to the mother tongue. But at the same time, I think that it's really important now that we are publishing into Makua, Shang, uh, Shangana and Sena, because those are the languages with most speakers in Mozambique, uh, even though that the, the major one, Makua, only has 26% speakers, but it enable, uh, enables um, communication within the northern, central, and southern region because they are um, mutually intelligible with the, with the other languages. And I think that uh, when we do the reverse, uh, translating from Bantu languages into Portuguese, we have seen some examples. Uh, we have some scholars that have published um, literature in a bilingual format. So you have uh, one case in Changana and Portuguese. And I think that was the first step uh, towards what I said, it's standardization of how we write these this languages. Because one, one thing that happens now, if you text with someone over WhatsApp, they will be saying the same word, but it's uh, written in a completely different uh, way. There are certain sounds that people say, is it a chi with a ci with a tch? How do we um, standardize the sounds that we that we make in, uh, in each language? And I think that in a way, it's um, 
breaks that barrier because uh, people used to to believe that uh, we were unable to have intellectual uh, work in uh, Bantu languages, or or if uh, we write in uh, Bantu languages, we would only be transcribing our oral tra tradition and the folk stories. So I think that it's really important that by translating back into Portuguese first and then into other lingua francas, we break from this tokenistic uh, approach uh, that we have uh, and that's ingrained in us. And I think it's um, a prejudice that people believe that any local language would be of um, lesser importance than um, national language or um, colonial language. Thank you. Um, Johanna, do you want to add to that? Definitely. Um, you know, Sami uh, languages are spoken in Scandinavia, in, in Norway, Finland, Sweden, and the Kola Peninsula of Russia. Um, and in the Scandinavian countries, um, there, there was a strong assimilation, but uh, the possibility to, to emancipate um, was also there. So when in the uh, 70s, the Sami people started to demonstrate, and mainly the writers were, were the activists of the group, they decided to proceed on double uh, um, layers. On one layer, on, on, uh, they started to publish also in Norwegian, in Finnish, in Swedish, and uh, in the majority languages. But parallelly, they collaborated with native uh, uh, Indians, native uh, other Aboriginal people from Canada, from US, and from South uh, uh, America and translating many things into English and even those uh, from those indigenous languages into Sami. And due to this uh, kind of uh, um, uh, uh, communicating their wishes, their uh, uh, traumas, their challenges in uh, English, they made it available for a larger audience and this is why the, the UN also uh, quite soon uh, um, developed the ILO Convention 19, uh, number 1969, which uh, um, contains the rights of uh, indigenous people that many countries ratified. And this is also um, the, the movement that extended from the field of literature into the other medias. And now we have many Sami singers um, in the field of world music, in the film, documentary film, um, and, and, and other arts. So uh, I think this kind of um, 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 translation or transferring their work to other audiences, other uh, uh, countries, other arts, it is a very, very important way to, to raise the consciousness of the Sami people. And also the first uh, uh, anthologies contributed in this process enormously. Uh, in the uh, mid of 70s, a Sami Finnish anthology was published. And of course, Sami literature has also uh, poems uh, which are 400 years old. So it's a wonderful long tradition, not only oral tradition, but even the written tradition is there. But one needs to collect it from the work of ethnographers and other people, even missionaries uh, uh, contributed a lot for um, standardized the language. But the final um, standardization happened only end of the 20th century which uh, produced a user-friendly alphabet. And now uh, the textbooks are written in, in North Sami in this user-friendly alphabet. And the people now learn, their, uh, learn how to write their language, which is of course very, very important. That also for all of us, it's very important that uh, we transit into the digital realm as well with all these kind of linguistic skills. So, now uh, people can WhatsApp uh, or write SMS uh, in Sami language, which contributes enormously into nurturing the, the language among young adults or young people. 
Thank you. I'm reminded a little bit of the, the Welsh language pro protests of the 60s and 70s. In, in Wales, there was a, a, a kind of a resurgence of activism around the Welsh language. And there were a number of protests that uh, took place through the 60s and 70s, uh, including the ripping up of uh, street signs. Uh, famously, people would, would tear up the, the village street signs and, and jump them all in front of the police station uh, during the night. Or there was a famous incident where uh, uh, the, uh, Wales was promised a Welsh language uh, TV channel uh, and radio channel uh, in 1979, where the the Thatcher government came in, and it looked like uh, they were going to the, the Conservative government at the time was going to renege on that commitment. And so they there was a peaceful storming of a of a, a TV transmitter aerial station uh, by some very respected, the most respectable members of the community, like vicars and priests. Uh, uh broke into the into the antenna station and turned the antenna station off uh uh blocking uh the you know stopping all transmission of uh, of british uh normal english language uh tv stations so i just wondered if there was similar kind of movements if if you wanted to share any anecdotes about similar sort of uh language activism uh from from the languages you're you're speaking in is there are there similar stories like that i'm sorry i'm going off script slightly Are there are there are there stories of activism in like uh, like that with regard to the, the the Sami language movement? A lot, a lot. So let me give you one early example and and one uh, recent one. Um, in uh, the nineteen seventies, the um, Alta River uh, was uh, uh, planned to get a hydro power plant, which meant uh, the destruction of the Sami uh, fishermen's life. Uh, for that, a lot of protest has happened. Even uh, students from Canada, from uh, Helsinki, from all over the world. This was also the moment of, of the, the, when the movement of the green people started. Uh, came there, protested along with the Sami. But um, on one day, the, the Norwegian police came with, as, with twice as many police uh, men as uh, protesters. So everybody was carried away and the dam was uh, built uh, forcefully. And 10 years later, the Norwegian government um, officially recognized that it doesn't bring as much energy as they wanted. So it was something that would have been avoided. But this uh, contributed to a change in the Norwegian policy. And from the 80s, 1980s, Norway supports uh, very well all uh, um, artistic, linguistic, and political movement of the Sami people. Uh, recent example um, uh, are again uh, uh, um, connected, for example, to Teatno River, another river where the fisher rights were taken away from the Sami. Uh, people protested, uh, artists protested, um, but also a Sami um, uh, artist called Mare Anne Sara took uh, 1,000 reindeer antlers. To, uh, and placed in front of the uh, parliament in Oslo, protesting for the rights of the Sami people. And these are moments um, which are very emotional because art transmits the wishes of, of, uh, of the Sami people very intensely and reaches, I think, really, really um, strengthens the, the message of the community and contributes to the success of the Sami emancipation. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Are there other similar kind of movements in 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 Mozambique for the, those Bantu movements, or or in Mexico for Zapotec languages? I'm really moved by that image of of all of those antlers. Mm. Wow, I I can't think of anything quite like that, and I think. I think that's very inspiring. I think there, I was just looking on on Twitter yesterday, I saw uh, another Isthmus Zapotec poet, Irma Pineda, whose, whose work my publishing house will publish in the very near future. And 
she had posted this map of language activists across Mexico who had been disappeared over the last several decades. And so on that note, I think it's it's worth remarking that in Mexico, the right for indigenous language autonomy so often corresponds or or, you know, comes along with the the right for broader indigenous self-determination. Mm -hmm. And so much of the work to preserve these languages is happening alongside a very active push to protect these regions, particularly from, from extractive foreign companies, often with the support of, of the Mexican federal or regional government. And so that that is definitely a very active active struggle i think of mikia sanchez the the soke poet whose work i've i've translated with wendy call for milkweed editions that's a a book that will come out toward the end of this year i believe but she's a an incredibly active member of the community promoting soke on the radio promoting its use. Her her variant of Soke has about 20,000 speakers, so it's considerably smaller than, than Isma Zapotec. But the work she's done as, as an environmentalist, I think, is, is not just connected to her work as a, a language preservationist, but actually, you know, I think she would argue the same work, part of the same work. So I do think that there there are some really brave language activists making you know their small acts of resistance and sometimes uh, bigger acts as well. But I, I can't think of anything quite as as beautiful and symbolic mm -hmm. as the uh, the signs before the police station or the antlers uh, in Oslo. Those are really inspiring stories, and actually I'm looking forward to to sharing them. Who knows? Maybe we'll see some street signs chopped down in in mm -hmm. Oaxaca now. <laughs> um, we, we we actually commissioned a story uh, about the Welsh language protests uh, a few years ago, which which tied into the building of a dam in in North North Wales to serve uh, Liverpool. So it's funny how the, there's so many intersections uh, between these movements. I'm also uh, I I bring up protest here just because uh, uh, yesterday was International Mother Language Day, and the idea of International Mother Language Day really comes or is tied to. Uh, the Bangla language movement in Bangladesh, which led to Bangla uh, Bangladeshi independence from Pakistan. Um, so it, again, um, the the fight for languages to survive uh, kind of intersects and and weaves in with sort of political or you know movements for autonomy. And it's interesting going back to the Sami example. I was reading about uh, Akala Sami, a language which was spoken uh, until the very last speaker. Uh, was was killed in 2003, December 2003, um, and they happened to be killed by a, a, a Russian burglar. Um, and it became a very symbolic kind of uh, um, moment for for the Sami kind of language movement. So the so it's politicized and it's uh, and it's it's woven together with with so many other movements. Um, we've talked about your work as translators and a little bit about your your two publishing houses. Um, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about at the beginning, uh, Shuk, just uh, with regard to your publishing Uyghur now as well. And you were talking about how you came came across Uyghur and how you st started working in that language. Sure, Ra, thank you for that question. I think, and, and I know, uh, Johanna, you know it has some uh, Turkic relevance to your, your work in linguistics. Um, the... The book of Uyghur poetry that, that Phoneme published, this is now a few years ago. It's called Uyghur Land by Amatjan Osman. And I met Amatjan through Jeffrey Yang, who on that time was, was on our advisory board. He's a great poet and also translator, primarily from Mandarin. But he's also an editor at New Directions and at New York Review Books. And like so much of, of my work, you know, this... I think it's these relational networks and these relationships with poets, translators, publishers around the world that have led to to so much of this, for me personally, discovery, but then also for this opportunity to to publish these these literatures and make them more widely available. 
and that's exactly what happened. Ahmad Jan is is very representative of his his generation that kind of emerged in the the early '90s and just before. And he and and Jeffrey actually collaborated to to translate the work. Ahmad Jan's exiled in Canada now. Uh, so the time difference wasn't quite as severe as my own uh, with this panel, but um, that's that's how that book came about, and and publishing it was a a really beautiful, great experience. I remember Ahmad John arriving in L.A. I remember, you know, and this is one thing that that I see a lot as a U.S. based publisher that that gets back to to some of your earlier questions, Rob. But the diaspora response is is really inspiring and really exciting. I think the when we had had readings, even in LA, the the Uyghurs who would would show up would just be thrilled to hear their language spoken aloud in a context where that's so rare. And to hear it spoken aloud from the stage or from a, a you know quote official venue, I think felt like a a real you know, like something to be proud of, in short. Um, so that book, that translation from Uyghur, that's the only one I've done so far. I'd love to love to publish some more literature from Uyghur. And it led to some other fascinating relationships. I'm thinking in particular of a, a Uyghur language rapper based in LA that I met at one of these events. But um so many, so many of our translations, I mean, our the the novella translated from Lingala. I had heard about through a writer from Equatorial Guinea, and he introduced me to to Richard Aliamutu. And at that point, a chapter of the book had been translated into French, but that's it. And I wound up acquiring it on that basis, and then basically having to find a translator who could work with the Lingala to produce this book. But I think that just underscores again how how relational this this field is, particularly when you're working with, with, as you said, quote, smaller languages. Although as, as we've said today, many of these still have millions of speakers. Mm. Of course, others have, have far fewer. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, the Mozambique Literary Translation Competition that you've been running since 2015. Um, mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how um, receptions to that uh, initiative have changed, or what you've dis what you've discovered, what the challenges were, um, and how that how that's kind of uh, inspired other uh, later work that you've done. Okay, thank you, Ra. Uh, I would like to concur with something that Chuk was saying about how difficult it is to find translators for us. Uh, uh, languages with uh, very few speakers. So that's one of the challenges that we are trying to counteract with the uh, uh, literary translation competition, because we don't have uh, any requirement in terms of uh, being a professional translator or having previous prior experience in, in translation. And I think that the next step that we have to do now is to make those people uh, professionals. Uh, I've met brilliant uh, performers. There's um, this uh, gentleman from uh, Maputo. Uh, his name is Majek Majeka, wow. and he is a spoken word performer in Shangana. And he, uh, I think he was one of the um, participants in the fifth edition of the competition. And since we have been uh, workshopping and trying to, to build these skills, but the there's this big, big, big challenge of uh, then bridging that from taking part in the in, in uh, the competition and then becoming a translator in that language pair. Because as I said, it's 42 language pairs possible. Hmm. And um, our publication is well received because it's quite unique. It's the, the only one in Mozambique that is uh, multilingual and particularly focusing, focusing on... Um, Bantu languages and we also do the audiobook and this is quite important when we are talking about a country with a very low literacy uh, rate and particularly in uh, rural areas so when we then uh, produce the audiobook in Bantu languages that makes people very excited about listening to 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 their um 
um, language. And there's another thing that we share with uh, the Sami uh, languages, uh, Ioana. Uh, here in Mozambique too, the missionaries played a very important role in standardizing the the language i think that the bible is available in all 42 mozambican languages uh, but we wanted to just go further and try to uh, explore because uh, mozambicans are known by for their poetry and i wish that we can soon publish someone like majeka he's not writing i think one of the problems he has is the standardization issue and um how to i don't know make his poetry fit in a way in what the, the West is expecting in terms of um, um, structure or uh, I don't know how the, the poetry reads, but I think it's a work in progress. And I think that uh, by growing uh, little by little this uh, limited pool of translators and building their skills, and that's what's happening uh, with the literary translation competition. and then we need the, the most difficult thing that it's buy-in both from the government. Uh, they have been uh, running some bilingual schooling projects. Uh, my mom is one of the linguists that's involved in that. It's, it's quite strong, but it requires a huge investment. It's 42 languages again. And then we, we need the society because um, people are applauding. They're saying, okay, well done. You have this unique book in uh, seven uh, Mozambican languages, but then they don't buy the books. So it's quite, quite difficult. And uh, we, we have always to bear in mind that we still don't have um, a reading or um, how do you say the, the habit of buying books and reading books for leisure. Thank you. I was just going to ask, do you have uh, government support and do you have support from uh, educational kind of system, the education system? Do, obviously, schools must be very, very important in this process. Uh, unfortunately not. Um, I think that literature and the book industry in general is uh, the ugly duckling. So whenever the government is issuing grants or uh, support schemes, it's for drama, TV, music and uh, literature is never um, granted anything. Uh, we saw with COVID, uh, there were lifelines that were thrown for those performers uh, in those areas, drama, TV, and music, but no writer, no translator got any support. Schools, yes, they are an important uh, partner. Uh, we run several programs that uh, try to promote reading, translation, and uh, multilingualism in uh, ch uh, school ch children. Thank you. Hopefully, that's that's an area that can be that can be improved, um, and hopefully, it will be. Um, we've we're obviously open to questions from people uh, watching at home on YouTube. Uh, we've already had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Bill asks a question which feeds into your report, Johanna. He says. Uh, he asks, uh, do younger people have support in re reproducing publishing culture in their languages? Is is there, um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with you, Johanna. The, your report um, kind of focused on young people as a, as a key kind of, uh, as, as a key kind of saviour or gatekeeper, if you like, uh, for, the, for the preservation of these languages. What initiatives are there for, uh, for, for the younger audiences in, in Sami literature? Thank you very much for this question. I just shared in the chat all the 15 uh, uh, recommendations for revitalizing a uh, literary field. It's not only about the Sami. It's, I think, uh, something that generally applies. And one of these, these recommendations is to support translations. So Sandra, I value very much your, your uh, uh, comment on, on translation. Uh, in uh, in uh, SAPMI, Lapland in Sapmi, uh, there are several uh, um, stipends um, uh, and various forms of support for young writers coming both from the Sami community and from the, the um, uh, official um, um, uh, culture policy. This is um, uh, in a way uh, supporting not only um, the creative writing courses, the literary classes, the 
the, uh, the, the traveling costs of the writers who go visit uh, school to school, but also all the libraries. Libraries in Norway always buy um, three copies from all of the Sami publications. So they have to uh, uh, collect the, the Sami material. There is, for example, um, a center in, uh, in Umeå at the Umeå University working with young uh, Sami um, students who translate uh, children literature, but 75 per year, so a high amount, uh, usually uh, by digitalizing the, the um, children books of other languages and inserting the Sami text where the original uh, or the, the uh, source text was written. Uh, beside that, I think it is very um, positive that the uh, Sami young people keep very strong contacts to each other. And this is nurtured by the mentoring attitude of the older generation. Let me tell you a story. Mirsa Slakvalkyata, who, who was called the ambassador of Sami uh, culture, and we know that all those indigenous uh, cultures where there is a world-class or, or a widely translated author, those indigenous cultures uh, blossom and uh, their emancipation uh, processes really gain much more strength. So this person, Nilsas Lakvalkyata, uh, supported Inger Mari Aikiu Arianaik, a young female uh, uh, poetess at her early 20s giving her advices. And this young lady asked uh, uh, Mirsa Slakvalkyata, uh, you are so good to me. How can I, I uh, pay you back? Or, or, or how can, where, where shall I mention your name in my books? And he's, he told her, pass it on. And this uh, young um, uh, poetess is now the mentor of the young writers. For example, Nilas Holmberg, who is the most crucial. So if you want to Google one name after this uh, um, uh, uh, talk, I will uh, give you uh, his name also in the chat. Uh, just do it. He is an excellent Yoik performer, excellent artivist, wonderful novelist, and wonderful poet. And we just published with White Pine Press his uh, uh, um, poetry volume called Underfoot. And this is the first single authored Sami a book in the US. And recently we also uh, received uh, the acknowledgement of the American Scandinavian Society by uh, giving us for the translators uh, the uh, Schoenberg Translation Prize. I actually just ordered that earlier in the, uh, in the conversation. So I'm really looking forward to reading it. And I really admire White Pine Press. Dennis Maloney, the publisher there has been doing amazing job publishing literature and translation for for several decades now well one um, thing it occurred to me to to mention just briefly in in response to that question about about young people is a couple of the things that that i think are really cool that are happening in in huchitan and and with isthmus apotec in particular one of the cool things that this happened a few years ago but i i got a copy the last time i was there um several of the the spider-man comic books have been translated into isthmus apotec and there's a very active scene of of young rappers often rapping both in isthmus apotec and in spanish and interestingly, some some of the established kind of older generation of Isma Zapotec poets have taken a mentorship role with these these young rappers and actually seen seen that this is an opportunity for for young people to communicate in Isma Zapotec and to promote the use of Isma Zapotec as something with its own cultural capital, something cool something that that young people want to do and want to be associated with which is is so important i think in that context so translation you know within that community takes on a lot of different a lot of different forms and some of them you know not not exactly what we would think of when when we're talking about literary translation in quotes thank you 
Um, I'm just going to pass that same question on to you, Sandra, but also ask about um, other media. It's another question that's come up uh, from from Bill as well. What what work is being done to preserve these uh, these languages in other media? Uh, Ashok, you talk about talked about rap. Um, is there uh, other initiatives in 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 uh, TV, film, radio, or other other art forms that is similar to to what you're doing? Uh, in, with those Mozambique languages? Uh, yes, definitely with uh, the advent of YouTube and the internet, we have seen many performers that are now taking it to these new platforms to uh, put their work out. And as I said, there are many poets and some of them are trying to, to build a, now a community of uh, uh, poets in uh, at least Shangana. Those are the most uh, visible ones. And they have been doing a lot of rap. A lot of rap here that is uh, been sang in uh, in Shangana. It's really really interesting to see, and it's becoming quite popular. And I think it's important because uh, from my generation that wasn't supposed to be speaking any local language, to have this younger generation that is proud of uh, speaking Shangana, singing in Shangana, and writing in Shangana. Just for an example, it's really really important. And let's see what happens from here, because uh, at Trinta Zernov, we, has, we have been exploring the cross-media um, books. Uh, we have uh, in our uh, YouTube page um, cross of audiobook with uh, sign language for the for the deaf. So I hope to see people exploring that and also developing some other dialects for the non-spoken uh, languages, for sign languages, for other ways of communicating. Because uh, at Rita Zarnov, we have uh, the accessibility as a, a huge factor. Uh, so we try to make all our books accessible, not only for those who speak minority languages, but also for those who are um, visually impaired or uh, hearing impaired. So that's also what we are doing. You're on mute. I'm on mute. Uh, thank you so much. We're, we're running out of time. Uh, it's, and it's just a, the beginning of a, a, an amazing conversation. Um, I think my last question would, will have to be very broadly. Are you, are each of you optimistic about uh, the survival and the vivacity and the, uh, of, of these, of these languages uh, and the future of these, uh, these languages that you're supporting? Or are you, or are you worried? Uh, I'm always an optimistic. I always see the, the bright side of things. And I think that uh, from the nine years I've been hosting the, the competition, I have been I saw the growth. We we didn't have any local language. Now we have five and it's growing from year to year. And I think that uh, the, the, the future is looking bright, brighter. And um, I think that as long as we can... Uh, still do this i don't know about joanna and shuk uh, i'm self-funded so <laughs> uh, i can only go so far but I, but i think that the future is looking bright and uh, as long as we have young people joining in and getting them excited about literature about exploring uh, ways to write beyond that just transcribing uh, the oral tradition that we have in mozambique beyond just focusing on folk um, tales that then we would have a strong uh, Mozambican in, uh, literature in Bantu languages. Thank you. Shuk? You know, Ra, I am inspired on a daily basis at the, the level of the individual or small group. And I choose to focus on that, I think, rather than uh, perhaps my propensity towards systemic despair. Uh, I am really encouraged that that panels like this are are increasingly happening. I'm and I'm really grateful to to you for facilitating this conversation and and to my two fellow panelists from whom I've I've learned a lot and I think that's that's just beginning uh, based on my book orders recently uh, during this conversation. But yeah, I think I think you know, whether or not um, 
many of these these languages survive is is yet to be soon or yet to be seen rather but i think the the work of publishing and and cultural production in them is is so essential to that survival and i really think for for readers outside these cultures there's an exciting wealth of of literature to be discovered and appreciated and i'm i feel really privileged to play a small role in that thank you Shuk. i think we all do uh johanna uh, as a comparative literary scholar i always uh, i have noticed that indigenous literature small literatures rise the question of bigger literatures earlier so uh, the topic of ecology, ecology crisis, of uh, ch uh, global challenges have been already thematized 40 years ago in Sami literature. So I just want to underline that in these small literatures, there is so much uh, treasure. It's really worth listening to them, watching them. And as Sandra said, bigger changes happen from thousands of small little uh, little uh, changes. So I'm also contributing to these everyday challenges, taking the best out of it, contributing, motivating people, networking, uh, and uh, that's the change we, we is in our reach, and we are also responsible for that. And I'm very happy to to go on and inspire and be inspired by other people and processes just like this talk. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Johanna. Thank you, everyone. I think to go on being inspired uh, is the order of the day. And it's certainly been an inspiring uh, conversation uh, talking to you guys. Your work is amazing. And just, uh, yeah, thank you for being part of this event. Uh, thank you for everybody watching uh, on YouTube. Uh, please check out the other conversations that took part uh, that were that were hosted as part of uh, Manchester in Translation earlier this week, and also check out the rest of the YouTube channel because it's got lots more on on these subjects. Uh, but for now, please uh, join me in thanking today's uh, three fantastic uh, speakers: Sa Sander, uh, Johanna, and Shuk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Very welcome.